Okay, welcome everyone, and thanks so much for joining us uh, for today's associates meeting. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker in just a moment, but I want to tell you a bit about some upcoming events that we have here at CEPR. We have a busy few weeks right now at this time of year. Uh, this past Friday, we actually had a policy forum uh, that focused on crime, policing, and incarceration. For those of you who weren't there but are interested, we'll be posting videos of those sessions uh, fairly soon. Uh, next, uh, next week, uh, on May 6th, we're going to be co-hosting an event with the Hoover Institution featuring a debate that John Taylor is moderating between two of his former students, the president of the San Francisco Fed uh, 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 and the chair of monetary economics at Gota University. Uh, and both were here at Stanford some years ago. And then finally, uh, Stacey Brown Philpot, the CEO at TaskRabbit, will be here on, uh, on May 16th delivering our associates meeting talk. So we have that and we have some other events between now and then as well. So quite a lot going on. But today, I'm absolutely thrilled to have uh, Maurice Obsfeld with us. And I know that his presentation today on the global economy is going to be very timely and interesting, um, given all that's happening uh, with international trade policy and with uh, global financial markets. As the economic counselor and director of research at the International Monetary Fund, Mari serves as the IMF's chief economist. And he's a great example of the type of policymakers that we strive to engage here at CEPR. Uh, we're very lucky to have Maury with us at a time when he and his colleagues at the IMF seem to be in a pretty good mood. Yeah, I think so. Uh, or at least a, ca a cautiously optimistic uh, mood. In the IMF's most recent World Economic Outlook report issued just last week, here is what Maury wrote. Consistently good economic news since summer 2016 is starting to add up to a brightening global outlook. Uh, so the upgraded forecast for global growth comes from a surge in confidence in the United States, better prospects in large emerging markets, and an increase in global trade. Uh, but the outlook, just a few sentence later, uh, sentences later, cautions against some potential storm clouds. Uh, in the same report, Maury writes, one salient threat is a turn toward protectionism, leading to trade warfare. Uh, and I'm guessing that Maury will get into that uh, in a bit more during his talk and perhaps the Q&A uh, today, but this is a, a warning coming from someone with a front row seat to global economics for quite some time. Uh, Maury is currently on leave from uh, UC Berkeley where he is the class of 1958 professor of economics and was formerly the chair of the economics department. He arrived in Berkeley in 1991 following appointments at Columbia University, the University of Pennsylvania, and Harvard. He received his PhD in economics from MIT in 1979, and he has some classmates here in the room actually with us uh, uh, today. Uh, from July 2014 to August 2015, he served on President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. He was previously an honorary advisor to the Bank of Japan's Institute of Monetary and Economic Studies, and he is a fellow of both the Econometric Society and of the Amer American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has received a number of awards and prizes for his research and has given several distinguished lectures over the years. And I could sort of go on for the full hour about all of his accomplishments. Uh, for example, he served on the executive committee and as vice president of the American Economic Association and is the co-author of two of the very leading textbooks on international economics and has written more than 100 research articles on exchange rates, international financial crises, global capital markets, and monetary policy. So please join me in offering up a very warm welcome to Maurice Obsfeld to Sieper. Thanks. Yeah, you bet. Well, I think I'm mic'd up here. Um, Mark, thanks a lot. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, last week, we uh, held our annual spring meetings in Washington. We actually have uh, two events a year, the so-called annual meetings in October and the spring meetings in April when uh, policymakers from uh, most of our 189 member countries uh, come to DC and uh, confer on the state of the global economy, um, attend seminars, have uh, bilateral discussions, and generally touch base with each other. And one of the uh, uh, signature events, which is actually the one that starts off the week that uh, I have to do, is the release of the World Economic Outlook. Uh, the World Economic Outlook uh, contains analytical chapters, which are released the week before. Uh, 
and then uh, chapter one on the state of the global economy, which comes packaged with our uh, updated projections. And we do those four times a year. Uh, in the old days, uh, we would do them two times a year, in October and April at these big meetings. But with the global financial crisis, um, our management, together with uh, my predecessor, Olivier Blanchard, decided that um, you really need to update the executive board and the world four times a year on developments. And the theory was always that once the world calmed down, we would um, drop the two extra quarterly forecasts and go back to normal. And needless to say, uh, we have never been able to go back to normal. So uh, there will be an update on these numbers in uh, July. Um, the October numbers were updated in, in January. Um, the world economy seems to be gaining momentum. And uh, the question mark uh, is one that I think I would, I would uh, uh, make a little less distinct after the outcome of the French election yesterday, but we can, we can talk more about that. Uh, but for, for many cycles, the, uh, the uh, IMF has been predicting uh, recovery in future years. And for many cycles, we've had to downgrade our, um, our forecasts, and uh, we have not seen the cyclical recovery. But now we actually see it happening in uh, 2017, at least so far in 2017. Uh, whether you look at soft indicators of sentiment or hard indicators, uh, as Mark indicated, since around the middle of uh, 2016, these have been uh, improving at a very rapid pace. Uh, but it's still true that longer term, the, uh, the outlook in terms of growth is subdued for advanced economies and commodity exporters. In other words, long term productivity seems to be low. And uh, this, of course, is a, is a cloud on the future and affects expectations today. There are also uh, risks out there, which are um, two-sided risks, but which we think are still skewed a little bit to the downside. Um, upside risks, US tax reform could be very growth friendly. Um, there's a lot of momentum in Europe right now. And uh, that could actually speed up. Um, but there are also risks, and I'll talk about some of these. Uh, the risks of uh, higher U.S. deficit are certainly there, of disruption of trade relationships. Um, tightening financial conditions, particularly if the Fed raises interest rates faster than we expect, might trigger spillovers to emerging markets of various kinds. And notwithstanding the uh, French election result, uh, there are still electoral uncertainties in various countries and, of course, geopolitical uncertainties that uh, we do need to worry about. Um, China is an ongoing concern, even though it has been doing uh, better. And I won't spend an awful lot of time on China uh, in these prepared remarks, but I'm certainly open to questions on China. Um, in the view of the fund, um, policies... Uh, are as important as ever. Um, they were important to support the recovery, and now they're important to nurture uh, the momentum we're seeing. Um, structural and fiscal reforms are necessary in a number of, of countries. Balance sheet repair is important in a number of countries. One could mention uh, some countries in Europe. Uh, one could mention China. And the financial stability framework uh, for the world's interlinked financial markets remains a, a work in progress and one that we should continue to work on. Um, there are a lot of common challenges out there for the global community which are difficult for one country or a small group of countries to manage on their own, and I'll come back to these at the end. Um, I'm going to try to make these remarks somewhat brief to leave time for Q&A. So some of these slides I'll run through fairly rapidly, but I'm completely open to questions about them, uh, about them afterwards. Um, let me start with a few charts that will indicate the broad-based momentum uh, we've been seeing since the middle of 2016, which is really um, quite impressive. Um, this slide is about soft indicators, 
purchasing manager indices, consumer confidence. And it's hard not to be excited about the rebound in these PMIs for manufacturing, uh, which are mirrored by increases in manufacturing output, by the way, um, particularly in the advanced world, but also in the, in the emerging world. Um, uh, for the advanced world, this is really um, a noticeable um, increase given the uh, time seri series of data. Consumer confidence has also um, ticked up to high levels, uh, again, particularly in the advanced countries. Uh, business confidence, not shown here, is high. And one important indicator we look at, world trade, which um, um, to some extent is an indicator of the level of uh, uh, trade-intensive activities, including investment, um, has, been, has been ticking up, not decisively, but we've been worried for a couple of years that trade has been growing more slowly than global GDP, and that may be turning around. Um, if you think back to the first half of 2016, um, financial markets were in turmoil, uh, very worried about the situation in China. Uh, commodity prices were extremely low. Um, oil reached somewhere in the neighborhood of $25 a barrel. Now it's twice that high. So we've seen a lot of rebounds since then in commodity prices, but particularly for oil and for, uh, for metals. And that's helped um, countries that export those uh, goods tremendously. Um, the absolute levels of those commodity prices still are low relative to the past. So commodity exporters, uh, whether it be Saudi Arabia or um, South Africa, or uh, countries in uh, French West Africa continue to struggle, but uh, not uh, nearly in as dire straits as they were um, early in 2016. Um, notable changes in exchange rates have been the dollar's appreciation uh, since the election, which has uh, reversed a little bit um, for reasons, again, that we might want to discuss later. Although this is following a sustained strengthening of the dollar since the middle of 2014, when it became apparent that the US was going to be way ahead of other countries in ultimately raising interest rates, we also see since the US election uh, a depreciation of the yen, very welcome to the Japanese, not much change in other major currencies, including for emerging markets. And one of, the, one of the risks that we headlined in previous editions of the World Economic Outlook, which now seems to have receded significantly, is uh, risks on prices. Um, headline CPA in, CPI inflation, um, as you can see in these charts, um, is stronger uh, than it was. Now, part of this is the uptick in commodity prices. But uh, if, you, if you look at these charts, sort of the, the, the cooler curl, colors represent uh, deflationary forces. The warmer colors are inflationary forces. And uh, both in advanced and emerging markets, CPI inflation has strengthened. Uh, especially uh, PPI inflation has, uh, has uh, strengthened a lot. And this is very much related to the recovery we see in commodities, but also in manufacturing. So the risks we had about, uh, in our minds about deflation, secular stagnation, I would say have somewhat receded uh, based on the recent data. Um, along with all this, uh, market volatility has been, uh, has been low. Market measures of volatility, whether of stocks or bonds, and the left-hand chart illustrates this. These measures have ticked up a bit recently, but by historical standards are low. And perhaps most surprisingly, um, one of the areas that might have been stressed uh, uh, as a result of US policies after the election was the, um, the emerging markets. And their sovereign spreads, having ticked up right after the election, have now come down quite a bit. And we are actually seeing portfolio inflows to these countries and very low borrowing costs, perhaps borrowing costs that are even, even too low. Um, one area where tension is, is evident is in the euro area, where spreads over Germany have increased in a number of countries. And uh, that's shown in the far right slide. 
Um, French spreads uh, grew in the run-up to the, uh, the uh, uh, election uh, that we just saw on Sunday. Um, these data don't incorporate what happened in markets today, but the spreads compressed a lot today as people feel they have a better sense on the outcome of the, uh, of the election. Since I'm at Stanford, um, it's obligatory to show the Baker, Bloom, and Davis uh, indicators of policy uncertainty. And one of the striking things about markets right now, and uh, you, know, you can ask me, but I don't have a good explanation, is why market measures of risk are so low, whereas policy measures in many countries tend to be more, more elevated. And in this chart, um, you can see where current measures of policy uncertainty are. Um, you know, for the US, um, they're somewhat high, but nowhere near as high as they were in 08, 09, or even the maximal level that was reached when it was thought that um, the US debt limit might not be extended in 2011. Um, for uh, Korea, they're incredibly high right now. They're at their maximum, essentially, because of the uh, impeachment of the president and uh, um, all of the policy uncertainty that that has caused. But policy uncertainty is not um, minimal. It's pretty high. It's um, uh, higher than you would guess looking at markets right now. Let me talk specifically about our projections. Now, these are, these are kind of a boring set of numbers, but um, one thing I want to say about these is that they are computed on a purchasing power parity basis, which means that we try to weight them by the real income in each country, um, adjusting the price of essentially non-traded goods to, to US levels. And this tends to give a, a uh, bigger weight to emerging markets, to poorer countries, because their um, uh, non-traded goods are cheaper than in the US. Um, for 2016, uh, growth uh, of the world economy on this metric was 3.1%. Um, this reflected a very bad first um, half of 2016, when uh, markets throughout the world were in a state of uh, tizzy, and that really sapped confidence and sapped growth. Um, for 2017, growth will accelerate to 3.5%, and this is actually more than we thought would be the case in, uh, in January by, by a small amount, and accelerate further to 3.6% in 2018. Um, much of this is driven by recovery in emerging markets. In some of these markets, growth has been negative, uh, such as Brazil, such as Russia, and all, of the, all these big emerging markets have to do is go to zero, and the growth of the world economy improves. Um, for the advanced economies, though, a major factor is expected higher growth in the US, which we can, we can discuss that, certainly, and um, expect, extra strength in the euro area. Uh, we've also seen strength in China and strength in Japan, but China is in the... Um, the emerging market category. Um, for emerging markets, uh, these countries grow faster. They're converging. They're catching up. They're younger economies in general. And uh, we expect, again, higher growth for them in 2017, higher still in 2018. And uh, China is part of the story. But there are also um, some offsets in uh, areas that are not doing well. Commodity exporters, as I mentioned, still struggle. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa is doing uh, quite badly, on average, largely because of uh, the problems of some very large countries, Nigeria, Angola, South Africa. Let me say a little about downside risks and uh, uh, what those entail. And I won't go through everything I mentioned at the beginning, but just a couple of things. But one, one area I want to throw a little bit more light on is on um, the risks of dollar um, appreciation, uh, particularly dollar appreciation, even more uh, sharp than what we might expect now. Um, the US um, 
government is debating some sort of uh, tax plan, uh, which will result in some degree probably a fiscal expansion, which could be very supply friendly or could be less supply friendly, in which case um, the um, extra demand would collide with basically a, uh, a uh, economy that is pretty close to full employment and full capacity utilization. And if that were to occur, we would see more inflation, and we might see the Fed raising interest rates more quickly, which would have the effect of strengthening the dollar more than we currently expect. Um, you know, in general, uh, if fiscal policy leads to an increase in capacity, either because there's a lot more investment in the short run, because uh, there's more participation in the labor market. Um, that's going to be really good for the emerging world. There'll be positive spillovers. But if instead we get the scenario with a bigger deficit, not much supply response, and sharper appreciation of the dollar, that could be quite negative. For one thing, the uh, interest burdens on uh, emerging markets uh, would grow. For another, some of them have uh, debts denominated in dollars, and there would be negative balance sheet effects. Now, it's very encouraging that through the dollar depreciation I described from the middle of 2014 until now, which has been 20 percent, and that's not small change, um, emerging markets have been pretty resilient. And partially that's because they have uh, built up buffers of international reserves, They've uh, done a number of market-friendly re reforms in general. Um, uh, it's been, uh, been a success story, except in those countries where you know, the political climate has led to policy dysfunction. Um, Venezuela is the obvious poster child for this, but Brazil has also had political problems. South Africa is having political problems. But where you see strong um, policy frameworks, relatively strong policy frameworks, such as the Andean countries in Latin America, they've been able to tolerate this appreciation of the dollar um, pretty, pretty well. Nonetheless, the past experience, as illustrated here, is that periods of strong dollar depreciation have also coincided with upsurges in various types of crises in emerging markets. Not that they don't occur or haven't occurred otherwise, but um, there is a pattern here. So we worry that um, there may be latent vulnerabilities in the financial sectors of these economies in their offshore um, corporates that may uh, come home to roost. Um, another risk from the uh, possibility of a very strong dollar appreciation coupled with increased U.S. budget deficits is that global imbalances could expand. And one of the um, objectives of the current U.S. administration is to reduce um, trade balance deficits, reduce current account deficits. Um, a uh, big fiscal expansion that is deficit financed would uh, contradict that desire uh, quite directly. So how that would play out would, uh, would be a big, a big question mark. Uh, and for other reasons, it, it, it is possible that um, a big increase in the U.S. deficit could um, draw in savings from the West, rest of the world in a way that would be counterproductive for those countries. Um, you know, one way to illustrate this is to um, think about a well-known paradox, or what's been called a paradox in the literature, uh, the paradox of the uphill flow of capital from uh, uh, poor to rich countries which is something that emerged very strongly in the 2000s, and you can see illustrated here. Um, the uh, story that basic economic theory has told us over the years is that poorer countries have less capital, uh, therefore the return to investing there is high. Rich countries have more capital, therefore capital should flow from rich to poor countries. In a very famous paper in 1991, um, Robert Lucas pointed out that not much capital flows from rich to poor countries. And in the 2000s, indeed, what we observed is a phenomenon of poor countries running big current account surpluses on average, and the rich countries 
especially at the US, running big deficits. And if you look at the left-hand side slide here, um, you see emerging and developing countries. And this big bulge in the 2000s is their um, surplus. The big uh, fall in the blue line is the advanced economies' deficits. What is interesting is that over the uh, last few years, this uphill flow of capital has disappeared. Um, this is sort of an interesting fact that isn't, isn't much noted. Now, if you look in detail at the right-hand side, and I'm not going to go into detail on this because balance of payments accounting is inherently confusing, um, you'll see that, that part of what's driving this, um, uh, this uh, reversal in the uphill flow is that private capital flows to, so the current account is overall capital flows, including what happens to international reserve movements. Private capital flows to emerging markets have actually been negative, and what's been allowing the uphill flow to disappear is that emerging markets have been running down their foreign exchange reserves, which they accumulated in copious amounts during the 2000s. So, you know, China used to have four trillion, now it's got three trillion. So, uh, you know, when a central bank uses its reserves, when it spends them in the market, that is an official capital inflow. So that, that leads to the question of how sustainable is this reversal of, of uphill flows. And I would, I would um, maintain that it's probably not too sustainable, especially if the US uh, engages in policies that lead to a big expansion of its current account deficit. Moreover, the fact that emerging markets have been losing reserves indicates a decline in their buffers of safety, which could be worrisome. Um, you know, notwithstanding the uphill flow, and again, this is another confusing diagram, so I'll leave it to you to look at it in, uh, uh, you know, at your leisure, but, um, you know, the, the reason the uphill flow occurred is because um, in the period from the Asian financial crisis, late 90s to 2008, um, advanced economies reduced both saving and investment, but they reduced saving more. Whereas emerging markets increased both saving and investment, but they increased saving more than investment. Now, interestingly, this idea that investment should migrate from advanced to emerging markets is pretty consistent with the story that emerging markets don't have as much capital and they should invest more. But there were huge changes in saving patterns that swamped this. On the right hand, which is for 2008 to now, you'll see that uh, for advanced economies, um, investment fell even more than saving. So we still see investment migrating to poorer countries, but investment fell so much in advanced economies after the crisis. Uh, that it fell even more than the decline in saving. And so their current accounts, which are the difference, uh, actually improved. Whereas for emerging markets, investment rose more than saving, and their current account deficits uh, increased. So we do see capital, uh, in some sense, moving, in the sense that investment is being reallocated toward these faster-growing, poorer economies, we don't see this necessarily reflected in current accounts in all, in all periods. Now, I mentioned that productivity growth um, uh, is expected to be low going forward. Part of that has to do with the uh, um, poor investment performance we see in uh, advanced economies, no doubt. But there's also a broader trend, even extending to emerging markets, of lower uh, productivity growth. Um, here are the smooth trends in TFP growth, total factor productivity, um, which is measured as a residual and therefore probably with considerable error, but is broadly indicative of the fact that, you know, for emerging markets in the mid-2000s, we saw, uh, you know, very high increases in output beyond what you could explain with standard inputs of capital and quality adjusted labor. And, um, these trends have, have gone away. Um, uh, for advanced economies, uh, TFP growth is certainly lower than it was in the early 2000s. And you can see on the right how much of this was driven 
for advanced economies, mostly for the US, by the ICT boom, which by the mid-2000s had, had more or less petered out. Um, we recently did a, uh, a study on productivity growth, and one of the, one of the uh, things we wanted to accomplish there was to look at longer-run trends, but also look at legacies of the crisis. And one legacy that seems very distinct is that you know, financially stressed firms uh, have grown more slowly since, uh, since the crisis. Um, the left-hand side chart indicates this and looks at firms in terms of the rollover risk of their balance sheets. The basic idea we were going to try to get at here, the, the, the idea that motivated our looking at this was the, um, the Holmstrom T. Roll work on liquidity, where they um, tie investment in long-term projects to a firm's ability to access finance should it need more during the, uh, the interim period of the project. Now, firms that have high rollover risk, by definition, uh, would worry about access to liquidity for long-term projects that suddenly need more finance. And uh, you would think that those firms would do less investment, less investment in their productivity, and might show lower TFP growth. And that's the pattern we saw in the data. Obviously, this, this all requires more work. Um, another uh, trend, which is a, a long-term, more structural trend, comes from education. Um, the quality of human capital, as measured by um, uh, educational attainment, has been going down uh, uh, since the 1980s, both for advanced economies and for emerging, emerging markets. At least the rate of increase in educational attainment uh, has been going down. And that's also been a drag on longer term productivity. Uh, the last snapshot I'm going to give you, and again, these are snapshots because we don't really have time to go into any depth right now, is related to some, uh, some other work we did in the, in the World Economic Outlook uh, that just came out last week. We have a chapter on understanding labor share uh, in GDP. Uh, this has been on a declining trend for many economies, and particularly if you look at economies on a population-weighted basis, um, uh, including China and India, um, it's been going down across emerging and advanced economies. And there's significant debate about why this should be and what is the significance of these changes. Um, it's not obvious that this is a uh, an issue of any uh, welfare significance to, to anyone or to any, any even, even that it has an uh, impact on measures of inequality. But on average, at least in advanced economies, declines in labor share of GDP seem to be associated with increases in inequality. Um, part of the analysis um, confirms what uh, Brent Neiman and Lucas Karabarbunas found in their piece in the QJE a couple of years ago, that technology is very important for understanding what's happened in advanced economies. That falls in the price of investment goods have led to capital labor substitution, and our results are very consistent with theirs, although we use updated and expanded data. For emerging markets, we found a very different result, that that the increase in inequality that we see seems to be associated with uh, the uh, growth of global value chains, what we call trade here in this picture, uh, but which we measure by um, um, intermediate imports and their importance in trade. Now again, this is not necessarily a, uh, a negative thing. Um, it could simply be that with more capital coming into these poorer countries, labor share is going down, but the overall productivity of workers is increasing and they're gaining. Um, some support for the technological theory comes from looking in more detail in the advanced economies at the right-hand side chart, uh, which shows where the falls in labor share have been concentrated by skill level. Um, even for middle-skilled workers, uh, their share in GDP has fallen but the picture is different from 
high-skilled workers where GDP shares have, have risen. And this is consistent with technological stories of the change. Um, you know, what about the different outcomes and possible attitudes in emerging markets? And one of the interesting things about survey data is, uh, and I'm thinking here of the Pew survey, which actually surveys attitudes toward trade. If you ask people whether in advanced economies or emerging markets, do you think trade is good or bad? Like a lot of people will say it's mostly good. And that gives you, that question gives you no information. If you ask people about trade's effect on jobs and wages, it's much more likely that respondents in advanced economies will say trade is bad for jobs and trade is bad for wages. And that those in emerging markets will say it's good for jobs and it's good for wages. And part of the reason I think you can see in this chart, um, this is actually from a, from a uh, set of countries that were part of another survey by Deloitte. And in this survey, um, uh, Deloitte asked well-educated millennials in various countries, are you optimistic about the future or are you pessimistic about the future? Something like two-thirds in emerging markets said they were optimistic about the future, and only about one-third in advanced economies said they were optimistic about the future. And I think this chart kind of summarizes you know, what we've seen, which is that uh, looking at the right, um, in, uh, there we go. You know, in the emerging markets, even at the lower reaches of uh, the income distribution, the gains in um, income have been, have been, in percentage terms, very, very significant. Glad that's not me. Um, uh, if you look at advanced economies, um, it's, um, it's a much bleaker scene for those at the bottom and at the middle. So, you know, the numbers like Gini coefficients for poor countries, much more inequality than in the advanced economies, with the exception of the U.S. The U.S. is kind of singular in that respect. But if you look at changes over time and whether gains from growth have been widely shared, you know, emerging markets are actually doing well, and there seems to be a consensus there for trade. And in fact, when we have meetings like last week, emerging market uh, uh, policymakers will say, you know, we can't understand why there's all this antipathy toward trade. It has been great for us. It has brought millions of people out of poverty. You know, a lot of our advancement is due to trade. Why are you guys in the advanced economy so upset about it? Okay, let me just conclude. Um, I talked about policies before, I don't want to run through this whole, this whole list because we are kind of running out of time. But um, you know, if, you, if you want to know more about our policy prescriptions, go to the web, download the World Economic Outlook for April 2017, it's all there. Uh, I just want to talk about um, really the last bit of this, which is about multilateralism and how important that is, because I think that was a major, really a major focus of the discussion in Washington's uh, meetings last week, both in the fund and outside of the fund. Um, what we have pushed for is to really refocus the trade discussion on the, the benefits of integration, but also on how do we minimize the or mitigate the cost to those who lose from trade? Because as we know, trade, but not only trade, but almost any big change, uh, whether it's a policy change or a technological change, brings about winners and losers, and uh, uh, if the losers feel consistently they're getting a raw deal, it is going to undermine the, poli the policy process, the process of creating structural reforms that you know, benefit the economy in the aggregate and reach highest productivity levels. Um, there are, other than trade, a range of other um, public good problems in the global economy and um, you know these these pose threats that I think we can't we can't really um, forget about. I would um, say financial stability and the need to coordinate among countries in regulation and supervision is a big one here. But there are also issues that we don't think about as much and should. Um, climate is a huge uh, problem, requires a multilateral solution. 
the problems of disease, the problems of refugees, the problems of famine, all of those are areas where there can be big economic spillovers between countries and between continents and where global responses can help stabilize the, the economy. And if you don't think refugees can be a problem, look not only at Europe, but look at uh, countries like Jordan and Lebanon, uh, which have uh, you know, unbelievably high percentages of their populations, of their workforces right now are refugees. And uh, you know, it really endangers the stability of those economies. Jordan is kind of an anchor country in the Middle East. And uh, if, if the regime there were, were to be endangered, it would not be a good outcome. So these are all things the global economy has to continue working on. And I'll stop there. Thank you. So thanks uh, for that uh, presentation. I'm, given our time, I'm just going to throw out one question. There are many questions that I would like to ask, but I'm sure others in the audience will have, uh, will have additional questions for you. So one of the things I noticed from the slides, actually, just as you were presenting it and going through them, was that um, there have been revisions to some of the forecasts since January 2017 in the most recent uh, outlook. And the country with the biggest upward re revision actually was the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's related to an event. Uh, many of the people here were at our event uh, a few weeks ago we had John Vickers here from Oxford talking about Brexit and uh, you know, concerns about it uh, you know, and, and the implications of what might lie ahead. But one of the things that he had said then was that you know, the, the, in terms of the hard data, it didn't look as, as, as bad so far as, as people were thinking. And, and so I'm, I'm curious to, for your sense of what Brexit, you know, we have the election yesterday in France and who knows what lies ahead, but sort of what What's on the horizon in Europe and in terms of, of, of trade policy and, and, um, and, and so forth? So at Brexit and, and especially. Yeah, um, I, you know, the, the details of the, uh, I think John Vickers covered, you know, pretty well, the, you know, the reasons for these revisions. And uh, we still expect that in the longer term, um, uh, there will be a negative supply side response from Brexit as, um, you know, Britain finds its trade relationship change as, um, you know, investors who might have come to Britain because of its market access either don't come or depart, um, particularly as financial services migrate, migrate elsewhere. And, you know, why consumers have been so confident is, is a puzzle, which I don't think anyone has a good explanation for. There are theories. But... Um, you know, if we think that on the one hand, um, real incomes are going to fall, and they've partially fallen already because of the depreciation of the currency, but consumers are consumer skewing more, therefore saving less, that kind of doesn't say good things about the longer term. So, you know, we, there could be a, a, a sort of harsher repayment down the road. Now, a lot will depend on what... Uh, you know, Prime Minister May negotiates with the 27 other EU countries. Um, you know, if, 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 if what she has is a hard Brexit with a, with a uh, very sharp um, departure from the current um, institutional arrangements, including uh, no, um, no, no movement of labor uh, from the EU, uh, that's going to have a pretty sharp effect. And in fact, you know, when we do our calculations about the long-run effect of Brexit, about half of it comes from cutting off the inflow of labor from the EU. That's been one of the, the great strengths of the British economy. And um, you know, it's a strength in the macro sense, but it's also a strength in, in um, you know, particular professions. I mean, a lot of the national health service doctors are foreign-born. Um, so um, that could be unpleasant. Um, but, um, you know, a lot depends on how, how harsh the other negotiators want to be on the other side of the table. And they have an incentive not to set an example for other would-be exiters. Um, you know, a lot depends on how much uh, Prime Minister May can 
concede in terms of movement of labor or other, or other factors. And I think that's precisely why she called this snap election you know, to strengthen her hand in the negotiations. Um, you know, it's, it's an incredibly complex and fascinating political problem for political scientists because in addition to her domestic issues, the uh, uh, Scottish Prime Minister has played her cards really skillfully to try to push May toward a softer Brexit by threatening to call a Scottish referendum if the terms of the agreement are not something Scotland likes. So, you know, it's going to be quite interesting to see how it plays out. You know, in the interim, uh, as economists, we worry about the uncertainty effects, you know, the Baker, Bloom, Davis numbers, and how those might affect the, uh, the British economy and also the European economy. Right. Okay, great. So I'd like to open it up now for questions. Uh, David, right here in the front row. So um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm, I'm really struggling with how you get you those U.S. numbers because, I mean, we've had very nominal growth in Q1. We've had uh, the consumer has uh, spending is actually down each of the January, February, March. I don't know if you know who David Rosenberg is, but, mm -hmm. you know, also consumer, th those uh, the, the consumer confidence and a lot of the other indexes are lagging indicators, so I, I'm just struggling to get to that two-plus number. Um, well, I'll say num number one that that number is not, well, let me say two things. First of all, uh, these numbers were finalized um, before we saw some of the latest indicators. For example, the last retail sales numbers, the last CPI numbers, um, and there are indeed a number of um, indicators beyond the last um, month's job growth numbers, which are also not notably weaker, that indicate a, um, you know, yet another weak first quarter for the U.S. Um, for the moment, we're looking at that as a soft patch. Uh, I think we're going to have to revise that if we continue getting weak indicators. And, you know, there are also some weak indicators on the credit side. Um, our internal tracking number for the U.S. Uh, for Q1 is not consistent with that number. And I think it's, it's consistent with what private forecasters are saying Q1 is, is likely to be. And Q1 will be, will be a lot lower. Um, the expectation you know, when we um, did that number, which was a few weeks ago, was A, that there would be some degree of fiscal stimulus beyond the, uh, before the end of the year. Um, you know, B, that the confidence indicators were quite high and would also help carry the economy. And also that the, you know, the overall growth rate for last year was depressed by, by the first half. So there's room for, for some payback but, you know, that being said, um, I think it's fair to say that, that, that both on the policy side and on the data side, what we've seen um, is, not, is not encouraging for that number. In fact, leading, not lagging? Uh, no, we're saying that, you know, at the time, at the time we were look, looking at them, we thought they would drive over the entire course of the year. Um, strong consumption growth. So this is, you know, a year-long, a year-long, uh, a year-long forecast. Okay, great. Uh, next question, right here, Ellen. Yeah. Yep. Two questions. The first is uh, Elaine Ray has been pushing the idea of the global financial cycle lately, and that uh, as U.S. starts to raise its interest rates. Uh, I think she's predicting it's going to be a huge uh, flow out of Latin America and some of these other countries of capital flows back to the U.S., and that's going to be very disruptive. Um, have you guys thought much about that? And then the second part was, could you just give us a brief update on Greece? I saw lately that they weren't doing so well with the IMF and uh, some of the medium and longer-term projections of what's going on with the periphery countries of uh, EU. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, on the first question, um, the downside risks I talked about of a, of a much stronger dollar are, um, you know, consistent with 
what Elena's saying. I haven't seen her recent, you know, writings. But, um, you know, historically, the U.S. has, U.S. monetary policy that has a big effect on emerging markets. Now, you know, that being said, as I mentioned, we've seen the dollar strengthen by 20% since mid-2014, and we haven't seen the kind of meltdown that might have expected. So, you know, is that because um, these economies are so much stronger, or is that because we've gone through, you know, 95% of their buffers, and we just have 5% left, and, you know, we'll push them over the edge? We don't really know. So we view it as a risk, but it's not, it's not you know, baked into our, baked into our global forecast. Uh, No, there's also a direct interest rate effect, which, you know, is, um, we've seen rates rise. We've seen rates rise uh, at the short end a little bit. The big problems for them come when long-term rates rise, because there is indeed, you know, the, the data show that there's, there's a lot of coherence at the long end uh, between emerging market and U.S. interest rates. And we saw this in the, in the taper tantrum episode in 2013. Um, you know, in point of fact, the Fed has been much better at communicating its intentions since then, after that you know, negative experience. And the normalization process, insofar, as far as it's gotten, has been pretty, um, pretty smooth, which is why you know, the thing we would worry about much would be you know, an unanticipated spike in inflation, which leads the Fed to feel it's behind the curve and therefore raise a lot. So a lot of it depends on you know, departures from what markets currently expect. Um, you know, on the periphery of Europe, I think there, there are serious concerns. Um, you know, I think, I think Italy is a bigger concern than Greece, for sure, because it's bigger. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, you know, I won't, I won't comment particularly on our negotiations with Greece, except to say that, that we're working on it and they're not concluded. And, uh, you know, to conclude them, we would need some, some form of substantial debt relief that the um, other Europeans would at least commit to now, even if it's not implemented until, until later. Um, but, um, you know, our, our forecast for Greece builds in the effects of... Um, uh, structural reforms and other policies that have already been legislated, and it's fairly it's fairly um, fairly optimistic for the next couple of years of growth above two percent. So we hope that that will be realized because that will certainly help a lot. Um, uh, you know, on uh, there, there there are a number of um, countries which are I think uh, in need of of more reforms rather than less reforms. Um, uh, Portugal is a great case where the government has actually been backtracking on reforms and where spreads are um, you know, already uh, 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 a bit high, uh, certainly higher than in Italy, and it's worrisome. But Italian spreads have been rising, and it's the combination of low growth, a weak banking system, uh, high debt, you know, Italy has actually done some very important structural reforms on its financial sector and to labor markets, but there's more. There's obviously more work to be done, and um, uh, you know, part of what the challenge is there is to actually um, uh, restore the banking system to greater health, so that it can lend more and support economic growth. Because growth in Italy has been. Uh, much too slow given the, the debt burden and the need to uh, you know, get the debt to a sustainable level relative to GDP. Jeanette, and then Jeff. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, you were talking about productivity growth, which I think is uh, a, a topic that we're all puzzling over. And you made the comment, if I caught it right, about the declining quality of education as being a factor in that. And I wonder if you could elaborate on what you're referring to. Yeah, I should have, I should have, um, I mean, I tried to course correct in the middle of that and say the declining growth rate in the quality of education is what matters for productivity growth. So, 
you know, what we're seeing is that uh, uh, education, you know, in a number of countries, including in, in the U.S. and other advanced economies, you know, invested more in education in the past, and the quality grew at a faster rate, and we've just been seeing, seeing less of that. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that is going to just show up in the, in the growth numbers as, as lower, you know, lower growth. Okay, I've got, I think, one more right here. Yeah. I observed that in a number of your emerging market numbers that China was pulled out separately. And my observation is that China is not an emerging market at all. And in fact, it would be the equivalent of calling the United States market the Americas and then rolling in a bunch of dirtbag countries that are entirely different. So when are we going to stop calling China an emerging market? Um, you know, it has not reached the income level per capita that, you know, Korea did, that Taiwan did, that Singapore did when we changed their classification. So when they do, <laughs> You know, in, in inflation adjusted terms, we will, we will, we will, you know, we in the World Bank will reclassify them. It's really based on a per capita income criterion. Related to that, what is going on in China? Do you want to just, uh, we touched on this when we talked earlier. Can What's you just going give us a little, China? we have another 60 China. seconds. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, China growth has actually, um, we were, you know, if you go back to, uh, 2015, early 2016, the narrative about China was growth is collapsing, the uh, statistics way overstate Chinese growth. Um, um, you know, it's a disaster. And the, the uh, I think Chinese growth did slow down markedly, actually, then, more so than probably the statistics showed. And the government reacted very strongly with um, policies that we at the fund feel um, are not really the best policies for the longer term in terms of um, you know, creating a sustainable rebalancing toward consumption and away from an export-oriented model. So, um, you know, the, rather than reining these back, um, you know, they seem to have actually intensified in the run-up to the party congress, which is going to be in the fall. Um, and in fact, one of the one of the sort of amazing things, if you if you actually look at the way the Chinese GDP numbers are, are constructed, is that probably the growth numbers over the past year actually understate Chinese growth. Like it's not the case that the way they do their GDP numbers always overstate growth. Sometimes they overstate, sometimes they understate. And over the past year, they're probably understating. Um, we have a paper on this. It's it's called the uh, you know double deflation problem for GDP. We have a, pa a paper called Measure Up, which talks about this. Doesn't talk about China on purpose, but um, if you want to know the technicalities, um, they're they're in there. And so, you know, they've really been growing growing pretty quickly. And so, you know, our question is like, you know, as you sort of build up domestic credit, as you um, um, you know prop up sectors which should be shrinking more quickly than they are, uh, at what stage do you sort of you know, bite the bullet and do what you have to do, and what does that, what does that look like? And you know, we don't know exactly when that will occur, how disruptive it could be. Okay. Well, great. Well, with that, I think we're out of time, so uh, please join me in thanking Mori Abstel for more time. <laughs>